Hi, Kitty Cats. I am Amethyst Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you are already a subscriber, thank you so much for your ongoing support. Subscribers not only receive new content directly to their inboxes as soon as it publishes, but are also able to interact with every contributor directly. And that includes me. And like, I want to interact with me. So there you are. If you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other podcast videos and written articles by our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links you're going to find in the show notes. So today I am very honored to be speaking with Andrea Lee. Hi, Andrea. Hi, how are you? I'm doing okay. And it's even better because now I'm talking to you. How are you doing? I am well. I'm really well. Thanks for asking. Good. So Andrea is a high impact coach, a fashionista, and also co-host on um, Thriving Women Network TV. Andrea, I know you've had a long career career both in pharmaceuticals and ranching, which is interesting. And now Andrea coaches others to embrace the experience that life brings to them, helps them fulfill their potential. And that obviously aligns with a lot of what I talk about too. So that was why I wanted to talk to you, Andrea. So let me start kind of from the beginning because because you I can look at your experience and it's very eclectic. And I have to figure that your early life has affected where you are now and this message that you bring about embracing life. And you put it as embracing the experience, finding the meaning and purpose by experiencing it. How did your early life play into who you are now? Do you mean uh, in early life? Do you mean my childhood? And uh, yeah, let's talk right. about childhood. Childhood I had, experiences. I was, I was blessed. I was blessed. I was raised really? by two just wonderful parents that put the wow. wind in my sails from the beginning. And uh, I was led to, uh, I was led in a way that I could do whatever I wanted and that I was supported and uh, loved. And so no matter what I would do, uh, if I would fail at something, there was no failure. It was just learn from it or succeed. And that's how I've lived my whole life. There is no failure. Uh, we just we just learn from it, pick it up and get up, try again, or move on to something different uh, or be successful. And my parents have, um, they're, they are fantastic. They are great people. And they're still both with me. That's great. Yeah. I, yeah. I got to tell you too, usually... Usually in our community, in the queer community, you don't get a lot of support from your parents. And, and that's when I speak to somebody about overcoming, you know, having a positive message later in life, it's because they had to overcome huge obstacles. So I'm kind of glad that you didn't have to do that with your parents. But so was it just them being so supportive that's now brought you to this point? Yeah, I just I was loved. I was hmm. just, I was loved and I always felt loved. I always felt loved by, um, by my parents, uh, by my creator, that I had yeah. a purpose. There was a purpose for me from the youngest age. I was, um, taught that there was a purpose. Um, I inherently, and I knew that was true and yeah. it took a long time to, it took a long time to find out what that was, which, which, Interestingly enough, I don't think I've had that question and, and started answering it in the way that I am right now. But I think it's very clear that I that now I now I know why I've lived my life the way I have and and where I sit with uh, what I'm doing today moving forward. Uh, I can look and see. I can look and see that. Um, and we can talk about that more going forward. Uh, I'd but, love to. I'm ready now. I'd love to hear. I mean, how does. You had a purpose. Did you did you know the purpose like earlier on, earlier on when you were a kid? Or? No, I didn't. And okay. um, 
And so when we talk about the experience of life and my eclectic experience, so prof- so my professional, uh, I went to the University of Oklahoma. I graduated. I had a great, I mean, if you want to know what my early childhood was like, you need to go to Netflix and watch Stranger Things because that's <laughs> the kind of, that's the kind of childhood I had. I rode my bikes everywhere with my friends cool. and we played with our GI Joes and then we p- read comic books and then we drank <laughs> and we and we did a great it was just a great normal childhood growing wow. up in the 80s i also was very um i grew up very non-judgmental of other people i had okay. a father that was in that flew in the korean war uh, was in the navy wow. I had a mother that has is a counselor, and and so I had one parent, uh, one parent working in defense for our country who tended to be a little more conservative. I have another parent that is more of a social does more of a social work, and friends friends were a little bit more liberal, and they were all in our homes, and it yeah. was a loving it was a loving atmosphere. Uh, no matter who was in our home, and politics typically didn't get talked. Divisive issues didn't get talked. We were and in, in when the doors shut and the people left. We we're very um, outspoken with each other on our beliefs and and our religious views and our political views. And that um, as we have all gotten older, not only me from how I used to be, even as a child, very, because we were a very engaged family, very thoughtful family, very intelligent family. And we thought when we talked a lot around the dinner table. Um, and even as we've gotten older, both my parents and, and me, we have elevated. And so uh, we don't vibrate at that low level anymore. Um, yeah. We've grown as individuals. And so I had that. So as going back to your question as a childhood, I've been had that kind of childhood. I went into the University of Oklahoma. You'll find it fascinating that I I find it fascinating looking back and humorous that I was in the fraternity. I was in the Greek system in the fraternity. And I spent all my time to save money on my meals working at the sorority house and was equally as comfortable there. And so I had this neat of I was. Uh, you know, you look back and say, well, it's not unique that I have these deep friendships with women. Right. Um, right. So that's not, as you, only when you look back, do you say, oh, now I see why she was so comfortable with women uh, sure. from, from her whole life. Sure. Um, I graduated and went to work in the medical biohealth care, pharmaceuticals, uh, right out of college. And I had what amounted to over three decades in that uh, industry, very successful. While I was there, uh, I had made the decision to um, have experiences on a personal level. I am married. Uh, I'm married to a woman. And uh, we decided to have to focus on life experiences, not stuff. Um, and so while I've been very successful, I have, yeah. I have stuff. Um, but the ranching came as part of a personal experiences and triathlon and yeah. uh, and those kind of things. So uh, that was that. Do you have another question? I I do because I want to circle back just briefly. Please. Yeah. I mean, so you you did transition gender, and I don't know how long ago it's been. Not yeah. a many, not many, many years. Um, actually, how many years are we talking? Five years ago um, that you that you, about, that you began. Uh, about seven years ago started. The okay, process, seven years about ago. Seven mm-hmm, started. I would say that. Yeah. And you still have a good relationship with your parents, you said. Uh-huh. Okay. I'm just saying. know how that went? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I do. Because I got to imagine there's probably nine out of ten, maybe four out of five, of the of, of the, the audience now who's going, what? Does that exist? <laughs> so. It does yes, exist. Yes, I'd love to hear. How did how did that go? It does exist. Um, they had seen my style change as, as that transitional period started they'd seen Mm. me started get a little bit more of a metrosexual look in my style i've always been into high fashion whether uh it not it was a as a man or a woman okay um but so my individual personal style started to change and i remember the day i went and told my parents um i went and told my parents that i was going to i tried to soft sell it 
Um, because I thought they were seeing, they could see it coming, but they didn't. It's still their kid. Sure. <laughs> it's still their kid. <laughs> and my mom was even, even being a social worker counselor, she sat there in shock. My dad walked in the door. I told him separately by a few minutes because they were both supposed to be home. Dad mm. was not home when I, and, and I was so amped up to tell him as one can imagine. Right. Dad right. walked in the door. Uh, mom's still in shock, uh, speechless. Uh, dad opens the front door and she said, get in here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I told my dad, um, big, athletic, uh, Christian, wonderful Christian man. And he looked at me and he looked to the floor. He looked down again. And he looked up at me with tears in his eyes. And he said, do you still like football? And I said, I do still like football. And I smiled and I knew on the inside that my transition would be fine yeah. because my parents, because my dad knew what was important and that he would have been more rocked by me saying I didn't like football than the news I had just told him that his son right. would be a daughter. Right. I'm I'm upping I'm gonna up my percentage. I was saying four out of five, nine out of ten, probably closer to uh, you know, ninety-eight out of a hundred. I'm so happy that that, that went yeah. so well for you. It was, and I am very blessed, and I know yeah. that a lot of people don't have the experience I have. And so I am very I live in a lot of gratitude, I live with a lot of blessings and it also that kind of strength uh, that that gives me the acceptance that gives me from the people that love me the most gives me a tremendous amount of power, and yeah. so I take I take that to um, I take that um, seriously and I wield it and I wield it seriously and I will wield it wield it. That's great. Yeah, you you also have turned. Hmm, how do I want to put this? The American dream is really based on, I'm going to get a bunch of stuff. And you said you don't want a bunch of stuff. You would rather have life experiences. Um, what's the value of getting an experience over an object? It depends. Is that object a new <laughs> Corvette? <laughs> true. And is the experience, you know, getting punched That's in the gut? Cool and... experience. That's a pretty <laughs> That's cool true. experience, let me tell you. <laughs> um, because I chose, because I chose experiences and, uh, and, uh, and live in a more, um, experiential state. Um, I was successful in my career, so I have stuff. Uh, I do sure. live, I live the American dream. I, I still live the American dream. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm here for is to coach I people see. in that they can make that change no matter how aggressive that change is. There's no one that's had as, as an aggressive change, any more aggressive than I've had. There's sure. people as, as aggressive, but one can look at me and say, yeah, that's a hell of a change. Um, right. Yeah. Gender yeah. transition is kind of like that. So. <laughs> yeah. It's really interesting, isn't it? How, how we can still look at ourselves seeing what doing anyone that's uh, transitioned can we still, we've done the biggest change of all, one of the most impactful changes at all, yet we still back up and look at ourselves and are saying, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I want to do that. Yeah. I'm scared to do that new experience. And you're like, what the hell you just, you've already done the toughest thing there is and, and whatever. So, um, that's a great point. That's a yeah. really good point. And, and certainly yeah. now you've said that because, because a lot of what I've been doing this year is, can I really do this? Am I going to be okay doing this? Will I be able to do this? So that was a great. Hell yeah, you can, you can <laughs> do anything you, you want to do. There's nothing impossible. There's nothing impossible with uh, a little uh, good decision-making and making the choices. Sure. sure. Um, you asked me about the experiences, um, the meaning yes. and purpose. People tend to want to know they, what puzzles them is the meaning. What's the meaning and purpose of their life? The meaning and purpose of life is found in the experience of it. You have to know, you have to get out and say yes to experiences to get yourself on a trajectory that will put you into places where you find 
uh, your value, where you are supposed to be, what your meaning and purpose is. And it's, it is simply the hero's journey. And it's whether that hero is Luke Skywalker that was doing nothing before he said yes to going on the grand adventure and finding the meaning and purpose, or whether that was Andrea that had to say yes to triathlon and get injured and then to heal and do it again and then to ranch and then to design it and then to buy a ranch and then to sell it and move and then leave pharma uh, after a good career and go into something completely different into fashion and excel sure. and then leave fashion to coach high performance people. Um, you have to find out what your meaning and purpose is. It takes a while. And, and sometimes it, you feel like you're, this is my meaning and purpose. But as you keep saying yes to the new experiences, to what your higher self wants or is longing for, you still aren't there. The meaning and purpose is found on the whole journey. And you have to say yes to, you have to say yes to experience. That's the value of new experiences. And for our listeners, it's as simple as when your friends call and say, hey, you want to go to dinner tonight? Hey, do you want to come over and watch a movie? And you're all compelled to say, no, I think I'm going to hang out at home. Don't do that. Take that new experience. Anything that's the most exciting to you, that feels exciting to you, And when given a choice of any two things, the one that tweaks you in excitement, you choose that one. And that's the and that's the route to take. Choose the one that tickles you and go from there and you'll be on the right track. Everything you're talking about is you had mentioned, uh, I think, on your website that it was finding comfort Finding comfort in dis- in discomfort. Yes. And I mean, everything that you've said, because like a triathlon, I mean, I've run a marathon before. And yeah, you have to find comfort in, wow, this is terrible. And you have to be able to say this is terrible and it's okay for three hours, four hours, five hours. Yeah. My, uh, my races were six hours. To, uh, okay. My r- races were six hours. Um, I got hurt. Uh, I hurt my back severely. I couldn't Ooh. walk for a couple of months and uh, okay. I couldn't I couldn't wait uh, to get I had to leave my career. I, I, I had to leave the field on disability and stuff and heal and then have a surgery and then come back. But I had a great surgeon who said, Andrea, pick a uh, pick a race. Actually, he didn't say Andrea. <laughs> he sure. said Andy. He said Andy to pick a race. And. And I did. But the the thing about that is, is that discomfort. I had so much discomfort with the energy that the discomfort of training was not comparable. So it made the train, it made, there was going to be no pain in the training. And it was painful sometimes with, with, you know, when you're doing 112 bikes and then a half a marathon after you're after 56 miles, after 56 miles of biking and you run a half marathon, that's, that's painful, but it didn't, it wasn't painful um, where I couldn't walk. And, and so back to your comment about fun, being comfortable in your uncomfortableness, uncomfortableness is where the pain, where the growth comes in our development. And, sure. it, and that's where everything, every organism um, grows in discomfort. And a lot of us mistake uh, and I'm not sure what it looks like in this community, but in gen- in in general, well, I would assume it's a lot in this, and we can talk about that, what it looks like in our discomfort, because just simply because based on what we've done. But the fact is, we, we sometimes, imposter syndrome, you've heard that thrown around a lot in our culture in the last, yeah. I think it's the most overused BS, because it's really not imposter syndrome most of the time. It's being in a place where you've never been before. And if that's uncomfortable, that's not, no, that's not imposter syndrome. That's normal. Regular, so yeah. You have to be, you have to be comfortable doing, being, feeling what is normal in new situations. And that is uncomfortable. And so, and so that's, that's where growth is. You, if you want growth, you're going to have to be uncomfortable. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's in, it, in anything having to do with exercise or education. Yeah. It's, you yes. know, I don't get this at first and, and then you do, and now you've grown. An interesting 
parallel. I don't know. Like the fashion industry, I'm not sure how much everybody knows about the fashion industry, ridiculously high pressure. I mean, and, and for more than six hours of, an, of, a, of a triathlon. But I mean, so that was another place like you put yourself into that. I don't know if you want to talk, you know, why, sure. why in particular you jump into that, but just go ahead then. Well, I've always been drawn. I've always loved fashion, and 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 that's really interesting. It's it's an interesting deal um, personally because I was my my mom and I always talk about oh you were buying your Ralph Lauren in eighth grade with your lawn mowing money. Sure, and <laughs> and and she's right. I was so here I was at fourteen, fifteen years old, spending lawn mowing money on polo, uh, fashion, and things like that, <laughs> and 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 then when I went. And, and then being in the fraternity in the Greek system in the 80s, think Animal House and all the preppy stuff. Sure. That's the way it was, and that's the way we lived. And and then going into the professional world, very high uh, high fashion for men, uh, nice suits, nice shoes, ties, sure. all that kind of stuff in in that time frame in the 90s, in the 90s, and in the 2000s. Well, I'd always been that. I'd always been that way. Um, and then as I, as the transition of my life uh, changed, the, the love of women's fashion developed, and I was always a good stylist. Humorous part is, and anecdotally, is now my, my wife, as all of my transition was taking place, my wife would say, gosh, I now know why you were buying me all those clothes I didn't wear. It was right. your style. It was your style, not mine. Well, my and wife was is your a very Barbie boho, boho yeah. casual. I'm a very, uh, I'm a very upscale chic um, uh, in, in my fashion, um, during COVID, how that happened was during COVID when everyone was locked down and at home, as you well know, I'm, I'm an extrovert. Imagine that. Mm. And I was needing my people. And so I was, the places I bought my fashion and my clothes and everything asked me, said, Oh my gosh, you just are such a great, you know, your style and you know, the product come work with us, come do some stuff. Oh. And I, I relented, I pushed back. And finally I just said, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go moonlight a little bit after work. I'd already sold the ranch. So the ranch was gone and I had okay. moved to the city. I'd moved to the city. And so I said, sure. Well, I was good instantly, but I've always been good at human connection and sales. But sure. I, I realized how good of a stylist I was. And we made impact right away. And I was asked to take the leadership role of the brand in the city I live in, Oklahoma City. I and I said yes to a new experience. I was very thoughtful about what this would mean. And it was a massive loss in income. But I said, I'm going to say yes, because it's more important for me to not live with regret. And sure. so this is a really cool experience. I'm going to do it. And we were successful immediately. And then I was asked to do it again in Dallas. And, oh, nice. And, and went to, and Dallas is a, an, wonderful uh, place to work fashion. And so I um, had success in Dallas and personal issues brought me back, had to leave there, but I was mm -hmm. retained by the corporation as a professional stylist working at the corporate level and not in a, not in a, in customer, uh, not in a retail level uh, with uh, store facing storefront, okay. that kind of thing. Sure. Um, so now I work uh, with customers um, on a personal professional level working from the corporate office and that fills my cup because it's the stuff it's it's my it's kind of like staying it's like you get to stay a hundred percent of your, the time in your zone of genius that's what I get to do now and that's yeah. a, it's a wonderful wonderful role I get to play while I still am an entrepreneur now and have left uh, working for someone else um, I, I'm building my coaching business and consulting business on me now with my experience of change and that kind of stuff. So that's the yeah. fashion angle. It still goes and it's always going to be there because, um, because women want change and I have a, an ability to impact that for them. That's awesome. That's a great story. I do. It, it is a neat story. It's a I neat didn't, story. I didn't realize it was that it was only recently, there was only a COVID kind of thing that you, that you said, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and take the leap and get out of pharmaceutical. Yeah. 
And, and I had a great cool. retirement. Yeah, I mm. had a great retirement. So retiring early really didn't impact me. Um, I see. And I was, a, and then I had the ability to start a new career in an industry, and yeah. um, and so I've done that. I and like I said, I still do that. I still do that. Um, but my main calling now is to impact individuals and yeah. teams. And I work with indivi- I work with teams and organizations too on okay. team building and mission on people's vision and mi- vision, mission and values of their company and what they want. Yeah. And sometimes that if they need to tweak that, that takes massive change to, to tweak that and get the corporation turned around to living out what they say. Right. In fact, actually, let's, tr- let's, uh, let's pivot into that. Yeah. Um, one of, one of your big, one of the big points of your, of your coaching is, is to be authentic yeah. So I'm, I'm, you know, can you, can you sum up those 20 words or less untrue? Cause we still have half an hour. I mean, can, what is the role of authenticity when you're talking about success? It's really interesting. It's like when you, it's, um, when you are talking success is what's imp- what does success look like to somebody? Okay. Is it a yeah. financial success or is it a personal success? Um, my success is more based on, uh, my, my success is more based on personal, uh, than a financial figure. Um, but what has happened is as I'm personally successful, then I, then that the, the financial, uh, has followed. followed, Uh, So I've been more, I have been more aligned with chasing success with what's authentic to me uh, on the inside. It's authentic that I'm a fashionista um, more than I am a uh, someone that believes in the value of, uh, I believe in the value of making someone pretty by what I can do with them in, in their look than, um, than selling them the next uh, erectile dysfunction drug or something like that. And while that's hugely, I was instrumental. I was there for the launch of Viagra in that category. And yeah. All that kind of stuff. But, and that's wonderful. I knew that was an impact, but I see the impact of what I do instantly uh, at the mirror when I'm oh, working sure. with someone on an individual basis. So yeah. there are people that value financial success and uh, and work in an industry that isn't at all authentic to what their heart and their soul uh, live in, and so so I'm so that authenticity and success um, that is I think going to be found uh, question uh, answered at the individual level uh, I see. versus yeah yeah you, you it's a great point though you you. With your personal authenticity, if you can find success in personal authenticity, the rest of it follows. I, mean, I think yes. that's uh, that's an excellent. Uh, it's an excellent. I think it's something that people don't really see. I've had a couple of conversations recently, actually, where people were like, "Well, I couldn't possibly do what you're doing. I couldn't possibly transition or even talk about, you know, sexuality because of where I am," and that's. You know, I think that's that's ditching your own authenticity for the sake of a professional success. And I, I believe personally, I believe that ends up being more difficult, really. So and and it, and it may prove difficult. And 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 where that answer, where I think you are proven right with what you just said, is go spend time at an assisted living center uh, with a lot of people that are in their 80s and 90s, and you'll sure. hear. You'll sure hear a lot of, I wished I would have, gosh, yeah. I, yeah. or you might hear, oh my gosh, those were the best times. I am so glad I did this. Not And, and when you start hearing, I wished I would have, or you should do this, yeah. what needs to, that, and, and so with me and my decisions, all of my decisions were thought about living with no regret and not wanting to get to the end of my life, crossing over and saying, that's what that was all about. Damn right. it. I right. would have done this if I would have known. And me, I believe that I believe in my creator. I believe in that. I believe personally, Jesus was exactly who he said he was. And so when he says, he says, Hey, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear. The guy knows something. 
And so if he knows something and I believe him, I'm not going to live in fear. I'm going to go forward with, I'm going to move forward with the things that my heart and soul long to do because right. I'm told, and I, and, and that makes me very firm in my convictions that I'll get to, that I don't want to get to the other side and be, and go, I wish I wouldn't have been scared. Right. Right. You know, so, you, in, you know, in your, in your uh, thought occurred to me <clears throat> in your story, particularly, you know, the, with how supportive your parents were, Mm-hmm. Let me try this a different direction. What we talked, we just talked about was finding comfort and discomfort. And yeah. it sounds like your parents were very supportive. And it almost sounds, I mean, and I'm I'm extrapolating here, but it sounds like you didn't have a lot of discomfort. You had to put yourself into discomfort because you had a very big support network. I did. Um, very blessed. Very blessed support network. I transitioned my family. Uh, is a is a large loving family and was very supportive. Uh, my career, I live in live still do. I had moved to Dallas temporarily, but I live in the state of Oklahoma. I worked in an industry that's a very uh, white male uh, culturally sure. div- driven industry. Uh, although yeah, it's probably fifty fifty, and it's fifty fifty <laughs> in our gender leadership uh, mm-hmm. with Pfizer. You know, I was with Pfizer. Uh, so big global powerhouse. Everybody knows who's who's they are. Yes. Um, and when I transitioned, I didn't transition in the way the company wanted me to do it. I went to my team me- team members and I told each one of them on an individual basis. And I was on a team of seven white, mostly conservative men. We were very successful. I said I am going to transition, and they individually, almost I'd say six sevenths of them said. Great. You're still the same on the inside, aren't you? And I said, yeah, well, we were winners. We wanted to just keep winning. So I got the same thing in a different way from like my dad wanted to make sure I was still the same on the inside. My teammates wanted to make sure you still you're still a winner. Right. And this and this the one set the one seventh that didn't respond to that way. He simply said, help me understand. And my Mm. response was, I can't help you understand. I barely understand myself. And and he was fine with that, too. Um, And so and so I didn't get a lot of resistance. My and I I mentioned to this to you earlier. My transition period was short. Uh, I Mm -hmm. and I told you I didn't transition to be a trans woman. I transitioned to be a woman based on what my goals, what my goals were for my life and the way I wanted to experience my life moving forward. So my transition period was short. Some people have longer and some people never leave it. Uh, And some people embrace the period. Um, And so, but that wasn't important for me. Recently, I've embraced my past in the, in the present, I'm embracing my past more now. And that's a, that's incredible. Uh, and a great breakthrough for me, which is wonderful is to embrace who I was with who I am now, uh, because yeah. I can't, I can't make the impact I want to make. If I can't show people the change that is impo- that the change that is possible in people, I'm someone as a coach that I don't accept. I can't, I don't accept. I don't know. I move forward and I take my clients with me to move forward and stuff. So I don't, so I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm very opinionated. I'm very direct, but I'm soft. And because I've been there and I know what it's like to do tough things. And I have a lot of, I have a lot of compassion and I also have a lot of gratitude that I didn't have to deal with a lot of stuff. Have I been clocked and have I been shitty things said to me? Absolutely. I have, but I also know that that says a lot more about the person saying it than it does me. Yes, absolutely. What I was, what I wanted to, what I wanted to ask, oftentimes we think of, uh, a success story is it's an overcoming, right? It's you face this massive uh, adversity that you, this is a big wall that you were able to scale over and knock the wall down, however it is. And I, I think I'm trying to rectify, <laughs> I'm trying to see like the juxtaposition between our big success stories are shown as overcoming adversity. And we've talked about finding comfort and discomfort, which feels like an overcoming adversity type thing. And so I'm, so I, I, I'm curious how the how your coaching goes if you've had such a supportive 
you know, the transition was supportive. Your childhood was so supportive. Even the team that you were talking about, white men in Oklahoma, which, you know, historically, sorry about white men here in Oklahoma, but, you know, historically not not one that's ridiculously accepting of, of, of tr- gender sure. transition. Yeah. So I find it interesting that with as much support as you found that we're, that you, that we're talking about authenticity and comfort and discomfort, because it doesn't feel, if I were to, to just lay it out, it doesn't feel like a major adversity that was overcome. This is my it's point. Because coming. It, yeah. And it's because the adversity we all face is internal. Okay. The, it's everybody. The adversity we face is a perception. It's a perception that we think. We think we know what the seven white guys in Oklahoma are going to deal with. We think we right. know what the person uh, that we're talking to or is walking by or treats us shitty. We think we know the reason. We don't know the reason. And it's none of our business what people think about us. The biggest adversity and the hurdles we have are in our own minds that make us respond to the experiences of the past. We have experience in the past that that gives us a template for how we respond to things presented to us in the present. Sure. And a sure. lot of that experience and those beliefs, that's a belief that we have based on experiences in the past. So when some when a choice or a circumstance presents to us in the present, we have a belief system we operate under. And so much of that belief system is fucked up. And when when my coaching, when I can get someone to see where does that originate from, where does your behavior and response to that kind of situation originate? And when we find out that it was it originates in a way they dealt with their family from the earliest stage, hmm. when we can see that it's based on stuff that sometimes is nonsensical, then we can lose that operational belief easier and we can move forward. Sure. It's a, a very simple, a simple, um, a simple analogy is, and it's super simple, but it's, it, you can see it. The little child that runs to jump in bed and jumps in bed from three feet away because of the boogeyman under the bed. They do that and they do that and they do that. But at some point they look under the bed or they realize there's nothing there and they stop jumping yes. in bed from three feet away. When sure. we as adults and and growing intellects, as we realize that our the, the, the operations that we run our lives with are based on silly beliefs, silly beliefs are easy to lose. It's the harder ones, the deeper ones. But the overcoming adversity, the adversity is in our minds. And, and what we need to do, most people worry too much about what other people think. Stop sure. worrying about what other people think. And in our community, a lot of that, it's it's not our business what other people think. And and we just need to live our lives in in what we need to do. And it's tough, but if you want to have a if you want to have a glorious experiential life that you have no regrets when you get to the end of it, towards the end, you need to toughen up. And if you are going to be a victim to the culture, if you're going to be a victim to other people, and and typically you're not a victim to other people, you're a victim to what other people, what you think other people are thinking, then you're going to live your life, you're going to live your life always beating to the drum uh, of a different person, not your own. Sure. There's part of, part of your coaching I mean, and this fits into it. Part of your coaching is about teaching people to be more direct and cutting through what you've called small talk um, in in sort of corporates, you know, the corporate environment I've been in anyway, <clears throat> these are characteristics of like the alpha male. Do we want to foster that further in industry? Do we want to foster the characteristics of an alpha male or or does this does this still work? you know, for women, I think is where I'm trying to go with it. Well, so the, the being direct, number one is more of me being direct with my clients. If they, if they want directness that way. Now I, I will keep teaching it. I will coach an athletic client extremely directly, like, like a coach. I'll take someone who's a very, let's say a very sweet, 
girl who just wants to move from one industry into working for herself, all te- and she's got a personality that's soft and sensitive, all, all coach her soft and sensitive. Okay. Being, di- being direct, just because some a characteristic is, is typical of an alpha male uh, doesn't mean that it doesn't work for a woman. I'm a very direct woman, and I've gotten the feedback that it's quite interesting to be coached and led by a woman that's very direct and leads like a man and is soft uh, is soft in response to as a woman. Mm-hmm. I've worked for a lot of successful, powerful women that are very direct and uh, in their behavior in both of my industries that I've been into, both in pharma, medical, bio, uh, and then in the fashion and leadership, and okay. then uh, people that are in media and uh, in the media and entertainment, uh, incredibly, some of the most, some of the most direct uh, hard-hitting people are women in the fashion and the media industries. So there's certain corp- certain organizations that mi- that might be more typical of, but it doesn't mean that it that the women that uh, that's a that's more uh, that might be more typical of the industry that we're with and where and how and the ages of the leadership in there. The women that then behave like with a typical male characteristic, they can typically rise to the top, and I've seen it happen. Sure, oh, but having them having them not behave. Uh, having them not behave in a characteristic that's needed to grow in an industry might be might be contributing to a glass ceiling as well. So they have to look at. So there's that too. Are we going to? Yeah. Why is that glass ceiling there? Maybe that. Maybe you haven't behaved in a way or led in a way that allows you to break through the glass ceiling. Maybe. True. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? I, so. I do it, and I would want to turn it back around to say, well, what is it about the industry that that being a more alpha male type person as opposed to a more collaborative and nurturing type person is it is that a fault of the industry as opposed to the people in it does the industry foster characteristics of being a jerk and you know and if you have to go into characteristics that aren't yours because i think that i mean this is where i wanted to go ultimately if sure. you, if you what you're trying to be is authentic and authenticity contributes to success, and you're in an industry that has a ridiculous amount of, of alpha males who are bearing down on you. How do you maintain that? I um, that's a really good that's a really good question. I think that if we if we knew if if, if truth be known, you probably have a tremendous amount of males that are as uncomfortable in that system. <laughs> As absolutely yes, <laughs> and so I think that's kind of I think that's interesting. Now, when I look back on my experience, when I went into when I came out of college and uh, started in the healthcare industry, and this was and this was typical of not just one company that I was with, but of all of them, thirty percent of our this is in the early nineties, and thirty okay. percent of the men. Come, or of all the graduates coming in were academy graduates, military academy graduates, oh, okay. offering exceptional leadership skills. Okay, so that's a very alpha. That's a very alpha mentality. Also offering great leadership, it, but it because it, um, I mean I would think good leadership. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I would say the great leadership though is able to play both sides. To be able oh, so to what I was going to say, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm inter- sorry. <laughs> yeah, nope. You interrupted. That's okay. Because where I was going with it was alpha male military going into and and also has great leadership capability. Mm-hmm. Now going into corporate America, offered <clears throat> offered some stuff. Also at the time half of the graduates were women. So the military academies now are actually a little more, uh, 50, I think it's 51% uh, wow. women. And in the 90s, it wasn't quite like that. But the Clinton administration had given a lot of early outs to uh, uh, military. And a lot of those included military academy graduates. So we had a lot of uh, leadership, young leadership in corporate America flowing out of the military uh, at 23, 24, who had par- who had partially fulfilled their requirements, but they were uh, let out, released early. What what we saw was 
great leadership that didn't have to dominate on the mil- on the field of battle anymore. They could dominate in a leadership role. And a lot of women developed into great leaders uh, from under those men and women, because there was a lot of women uh, that sure. were coming out um, sure. as pilots and just in, in all kinds of military officers, Navy and, and, uh, and Army and Air Force. Um, so I saw a lot of leadership and worked under a lot of that leadership and saw that develop. And so uh, a lot of that is just working into the system, working into the system. We don't typically go into corporate America. Um, now, this is an interesting change. Um, but, but at that time, we didn't typically go into corporate America and say, no, I want you to lead me this way. This is the way I need to be led. Well, but sure. interestingly enough, interestingly enough, that's what a lot of our leadership looks like now, which is yeah. uh, good leadership now. It's really pretty. I think it's kind of neat is that good leadership now leads people to um leads people in a way that sometimes the individual needs to be led when you're working on such a diverse teams. And, and so in the fashion industry, it's very interesting. When I left the biopharma and I told you it was very monolithic looking, I went into fashion and I had a team, I inherited teams that could check the box. Every box was checked on a, sure. um, on a job application, gender, age, religion, color, creed, uh, everything was checked. And so and so, um, and so that's what I inherited. And so it was really cool to me to see, you know, had I put a t- team together, I would have never put a d- team together as diverse as the one I inherited by happenstance. Okay. But what I saw from it as a leader, what I saw was so amazing in that I had a diverse team that wasn't put there on purpose I had a diverse team that I inherited, and I realized, thank you for the cool decision-making I got to have by the life, here we go, life experiences that all those people brought to me to help me make good decisions. Yeah, those life experiences might be represented by the color of their skin, the age of their, the age of their being. Um, the religion they have, and all, and they have these different experiences to bring me to say, "Hey, Andrea, you might think of this," or "Hey, Andrea, uh, we we did it this way over in this city," or blah blah blah. And I would always think, "Okay, that's cool. That's something to think about." I would have never gotten with uh, in, in more of that monolithic. Not meaning that both teams were successful, but it was really cool, and it was a way I chose to look at diversity and the diversity in the job forces, uh, I could care less what color they were. And I could, didn't give a damn about how old they were. I thought sure. it was amazing that I had access to life experiences, uh, a wider range of life experiences that brought cool thought processes to me. Mm-hmm. I loved that. And that was, that was hugely important to me as a leader in fashion. I think you've just explained the value of DEI, uh, efforts in in industry so well i think we're we're seeing that play out and some people don't think it has a lot of value and some people maybe some people maybe focus on the wrong thing or some people like like in um in a couple of states there are states where they say you're no longer going to teach d and d e and i um and and so and i look at that and so i'm i'm one that doesn't say i can't or see the negative i look at that and say you know who that's going to really help that's going to help all the people that wouldn't look at it look at it at all because they said they had to that's a great way to get people to do something is tell them that they tell them that they have to. but that's a good way right. to get people to stop doing something is tell them they have to well yeah. now when you take the compelled when you take the compelled uh Uh, behavior away, now people are a little more open to it. And I'm going, you know what? Those communities might be actually more open to hearing what I said on the value of diversity than they would have uh, six months ago. And so that's the way, that's the way I look at it. I'm not going to, I'm just not going to bitch and moan about DE&I going away in some places. I'll just sit there and say, here's the value of that now that you don't have to do it anymore. And I'll have more open, more reception of it. Yeah. There's a, um, there's a quote that I pulled from a testimonial on your website that says, yeah. Andrea taught me, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but Andrea, Andrea taught me that everyone is weird. 
<laughs> yeah, I loved that when um, <laughs> it's a good quote. I mean, it is, and 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 this is so this is so awesome because it stems it's it stems from how self absorbed all of us are, Amy. Okay, mm-hmm. I am I am so I I am a true believer in that most of the time. Most people don't give a damn about us, and and because most people Agreed. are so self-absorbed that we think everybody's thinking about us all the time, and they're not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here I am. I've transitioned. I've transitioned, and I'm and I've come back into the field after being gone for a little while. I've been. I'm I'm back to working in medical offices, hospitals, ERs, oh, and shoot. stuff like that. And I'm standing next to a doctor, and we're kind of watching some patients from a distance. Now I'm get. This is like two months after I'm transitioned, um, returned to the field as a woman. I left, but I left as a, a man. And I want to tell you that story and professional how that went with my clients before yeah. we leave. But I'm standing shoulder to shoulder with this doctor watching from a distance. And I said, gosh, that guy over there sure is weird. And then I just, and then I went, that sounded pretty funny, didn't it? And he goes, <laughs> we're all, he, and this is the guy that saw patients all the time. And he goes, we're all weird. And there so when I was, so I must've told that story several times to people that worked with me or worked with me as a client. And I loved that that was in the testimonial because yeah. um, from observation, she might be. And so, um, but for, but, but we find comfort in that no one is, there is no normal. Normal right. is not, normal is not always good. Good is not always normal. Half the country's right. obese, half the marriages fail. People live in massive debt and all that right. stuff is normal. It's not good. And what's good isn't always normal. And so right. that's what I mean. We're all yeah. weird and we all have our stuff. I like to think the way that I've put this in my own writing has been, there's no normal. There's, there is only common and frequent. Cause that's a good way to put it. I've not looked at, I've not looked at it that way. And, and I like that. It's, there's common well, Cause and I mean, cause you, cause you make a great point. If half of the country is obese, that is a, that is classified as a pathology. Is it normal for us to have a pathology? Now, we could go off on a really big tangent because that's now kind of become the foundation of what I talk about, that no, we should not pathologize any human experience, but should we call it normal? (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, so common and frequent. That's Yeah, and I think we should be comfortable in our, I think to elevate, we need to be comfortable in our abnormality. Sure. Um, I don't, I think that if for, for in, in the, in the community of people that have transitioned, some people, it is, this is what I talk about in my talks, because I'm a public speaker. Mm -hmm. And what I talk about in my talks is um, that we have biology, which is what is your mama told when you were born? And then we have identity. And that's how we identify. And that is a spectrum. And if you don't believe gender identity is a spectrum, you fucking haven't gone to the mall or the airport and people watched in ages because you it is a looked spectrum. Inside. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It is a spectrum. And so and so we need to be comfortable in our in in who we are, in our abnormality. And that doesn't matter if you've transitioned or not. There are abnormal people that are five foot two women that are as big around as they are tall. That's, sure. That is, that isn't normal, but it's not that uncommon. And right. we need to, and, and so we need to be comfortable and we need to be comfortable with who we are and stuff. And if you right. want to change and don't like who you are, or you want to try something different, that's my job. That's my job to help you with that. If you can't do it on your own. You you had mentioned that the labels are a big problem for you. You mentioned earlier that labels are a big problem for you. And I think we're we're discussing that to a certain extent. That that if you go, oh well, you know, I'm normal, that there's no normal. label you want to, well it's a label you want to apply to yourself, yeah. right? I mean you go, yeah, well I am cis and het, so therefore I'm normal. You go, well, but but even so, that, even even uh, no one cis walks around and says they're cis. 
and no one no. Het walks around and says they're het. And, and so you've got the labels, and here's this is really interesting. This goes to division. Labels are labels foster division, and yes. there are there are two types of division in this country. There is the kind of division that is fostered for political purposes or to mobilizing the extremes of support, whether right. it's on the right or whether it's on the left. I'm not talking about left of center, right of center. I'm talking about on the edges of the that, extremes. of that, yeah. on the extremes. And that is to mobilize people at, in, the, in, in movements, in politi typically political movements that is for the worst it is for it is for the worst reasons it's to mobilize right. people at other people's expense to win political elections primary primarily primary elections it is different than the kind of division that we talk about in our country that is based on they're Hispanic, they're brown, they're gay, they're white, they're from the South, they're from the North. These sure. are divisions that tell us uh, a lot about each other and to help us understand each other, celebrate each other. Our country is still a melting pot and we need, and most people want to understand the ingredients of what goes in that melting pot because it makes yeah. it that much more tasty and special. Right. And that's the kind of that's the division I want to deal with is help me understand them so I can just understand and make our make our uh, community stronger on a on a humanity level. I abhor the division that's fostered at the left and the right extremes. And I will yeah. battle that till the day I'm gone. I know what the right thinks for me on the uh, on the edge. They think that they know what God wants best for me. And they won't even look at what the Christ says and take the stick out of their own eye to see that they shouldn't be judging. And the left just thinks they want to engage everybody into acting proper so that the people they represent don't get their feelings hurt. Well, they should sure. just, they should just um, step out of that a little while. Don't act for me. When I transitioned, I went straight to the people I work with intimately and told them what was going on. I left the field. They were put through diversity training when they didn't need to and told how to deal with Andrea. Andrea wasn't even, invo wasn't even involved in it. Oh, now, I know, and, and that is no bueno. And it was, I'm sure it was done for legal reasons and mandated mm -hmm. to happen at human resources level, but it's silly. And it was wrong. And I don't like that as much as I don't like uh, people that think they know what God wants for Andrea. And so I look at those examples. And so I don't like the labels of, of having it be someone else's responsibility to call me she or call me her or whatever. It is compelled validation. If they call me him and her, him and whatever, um, uh, around me, it's it's shitty, and it says more about them. If they have, to, or if they're compelled to act in a certain way when I'm not around, well, number one, it's not my business what they think, but it's it's just simply it's just simply wrong. And I call, and that's what I call. I call it compelled validation. Um, yeah. And I don't need I don't need anybody compelled to uh, help me feel properly. Um, anyway, so I can go off on a tangent on this stuff. So. No, it's a great, great point. <laughs> right. No, it's a great, great point. And, and I don't, you know, I think I stand with you in a whole lot of it. So, yeah, we are, however, running out of time. So I wanted to ask you, how can I mean, obviously, there's a lot that you have to offer. How do how do people find you? How do we find Andrea Lee? At Andrea Lee dot com. And it's and it's Andrea Lee is spelled L-E-I-G-H. And if someone would like to consider um, a get acquainted call with me, and that would be for work as a um, high performance coach, they can book a call with me on andrealee.com on the contact uh, page. And I am at the real Andrea Lee on Instagram, and they could DM me there if they wanted to. I'm, I'm on Instagram, and uh, I've been... 
Uh, I post quite a bit and I engage in my story so people can see what I do on a daily basis a lot. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for asking. Yeah, no, I mean, this has been a great conversation. I'm glad, you know, I'm glad we had the ability to, to, to talk through some of the weird, you know, just the division. I think you have a great point with the idea that, that we, we seek some, we seek out some divisions and ignore the divisions that would, it would empower all of us. Um, you know, we seek out the ones that's going to, that, that will, that will mobilize weird people. I'm going to use yeah. weird. What the hell? <laughs> it's going to mobile, mobilize the edges at the expense of somebody else, as opposed to saying, well, these others are part of us. Why don't we, why don't we all, all figure out who we are so that we can, um, so we can be better together. I think it was a good, yeah, it's a good I message. want to, you're right. I want to understand people. I want to understand the people that I don't understand. If I don't understand yeah. their life experience, it's not that I want some kind of, well, we're going to hash it out until we find something uh, that works for both of us. I don't care about that. I want to understand. I mean, I do. Um, I want to find commonality. I want to, sure. I just actually want to understand the life experiences of other people because everybody has such a unique experience, Yeah, you know, yeah. and then, and the political division in this country, it's, um, it's bad. I actually think it's getting better, but it's, at, but when you, you see it in a lot of the gender argument right now, and I personally believe it's one of the last best places to foster fear in the, oh, in yeah. the communities. So the right is, is made to be fearful that there's a man dressed as a woman that's waiting to rape the women in the women's bathroom, and the left right. is, is made to fear. Fear is fostered in that they're, in that, um, they're going to um, be victimized uh, and future freedoms taken away. Do we see right. circumstances? Do we see circumstances on each? Yes, but it's just fostered and fostered. And what they're doing is they're they're fostering it on the on each other's edges. And it's just it's it's yeah. simply just it's it's just simply um, it's just simply abhorrent. That's the only word I can come up to. And the country it sees is. it. I believe most of the country sees it and simply doesn't care. But I'm not I'm not uh, blind enough that think that there's not. I used to believe, honestly, that most people didn't or I don't. I believe most people don't care. I used to think no one cared, but there are simply some that do deeply. There's people really? that deeply care, genuinely deeply care on the edges. And I can I can uh, I see that. Um, but they don't speak for the, they don't speak for most people, but they, but they're no. there and, um, and it's good to know that. Yeah, no, it's a constituency and, you know, you always yeah. find your constituencies, right? So, yes. Sometimes so in places, sometimes you have constituents you never thought you'd have. <laughs> I got it. Yeah, I got, yeah. There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> Sure oh is. my gosh! Asked me twenty no. years ago, and I and I'd uh, I'd think, right. uh, well, for me to get here on this, if you told me I'd be doing this stuff twenty years ago, I'd say, um, wow, that must be an it, that's that must be going to be an experience. <laughs> yeah, Do, you know, it's funny think... to get there, and it was <laughs> right. I think if you told me twenty years ago this is what you're going to be doing, I think I would go, yeah, okay, I can see that. <laughs> I think I could. <laughs> Really? That's the, you know what? That's the difference in you and I. And, and that's well, really sure. cool because we're sitting here doing it. And and 20 years ago, heck, I might have not had my Damascus Road moment yet. <laughs> right. I might right. have said, are you going to stone some tran trans people? <laughs> let, let me hold your coat. <laughs> my, oh gosh. Yeah, I'll hold your beer. Yeah, <laughs> right. Because yeah. cause my, my road to Damascus moment was... Uh, like 1994, 90, yeah, 94. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, there you go. Well, that we're was 30 unique. years ago. Uh, we're all, well, we're all weird, aren't we? We are, all, everyone is weird. Everyone's weird. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, let me go ahead and shut this down. Thank you so much, Andrea, for all of this conversation. Thank you um, for having me. Oh, of course. Yeah. I want to thank our listeners as well. And, uh, 
I am Amethyst Deherrick, talking on Gender Identity Weekly with Andrea Lee about high-impact uh, coaching and, of course, how everyone is weird. Thanks again.